Hey, good morning, and welcome to the Washington Foreign Press Center. My name is Miranda Patterson, and I'm the moderator this morning for this briefing. It's an exciting week here in Washington, NATO week, and today we are joined by Ambassador Mike Carpenter, Special Assistant to the President and Senior Advisor for Europe at the National Security Council. This morning, Ambassador Carpenter will outline some of the major events happening at NATO this week. This briefing is on the record, and a transcript and video of this briefing will be posted on our website, fpc.state.gov, after the briefing. Journalists joining us virtually via Zoom, please take a moment now to rename your screen with your name and your outlet. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Ambassador Carpenter for his opening remarks. Great. Thank you so much. And I'll start out with some remarks, and then I'd be happy to take your questions after. Uh, President Biden is looking forward to hosting 38 heads of delegation this week in Washington for a historic summit to mark the 75th anniversary of NATO's founding. That includes the leaders of our 31 NATO allies, as well as NATO partners, including Ukraine, Japan, New Zealand, the Republic of Korea, Australia, and the European Union. We're also looking forward to welcoming a large number of senior officials, including foreign ministers, defense ministers, and cabinet officials from NATO partners all over the world. I'm going to go over the schedule in a minute, but I first want to take uh, some time to discuss the context in which NATO leaders will be gathering at such an important moment in transatlantic security. For 75 years, NATO has kept America and the world safer. NATO is the strongest defensive alliance in history, and it has been truly indispensable to Euro-Atlantic security, deterring threats to the United States and our allies. Today, our alliance is larger, stronger, better resourced, and more united than ever before. And that's in large part due to President Biden's efforts over these last three years to invest in strengthening the alliance as well as our partnerships around the world. Our alliances make us safer and stronger, and we're proud to welcome Sweden this week, which will participate in the NATO Leaders Summit for the first time as the 32nd member of the NATO Alliance. We're also meeting this week at a critical moment, two and a half years after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, which has shattered peace in Europe and shaken to the core the rules-based international order, posing the greatest threat to transatlantic security in decades, if not longer. Russia's latest strike on a children's hospital in Kyiv testifies to the horrific, brutal, and senseless human cost of Russia's aggression, but one of so many tragedies inflicted by Putin on the people of Ukraine. Under President Biden's leadership, the United States, together with our NATO allies, have provided critical support to Ukraine, and we will continue to do so aiding Ukraine's brave defenders as they have held the lines in Kyiv, Kharkiv, and Kherson, stopped Russia's advances in 2022 and took more than 50% of the territory Russia seized earlier that year. Today, Ukrainian forces are holding firm, courageously fighting every day to defend their homeland. Over the past few years, NATO has also enhanced our global partnerships. NATO partners include Australia, Japan, New Zealand, the Republic of Korea, the European Union, and Ukraine. Uh, and they are all participating in this summit this week to advance collective efforts to strengthen the rules-based international order and deepen our cooperation within the alliance. This is so important because the global threats and challenges we face, including from authoritarian actors and terrorist organizations, are all inextricably linked. NATO allies are also making significant investments in our own defense and deterrence capabilities. When the Biden-Harris administration took office, only nine allies were spending at least 2% of GDP on defense. Today, a record 23 allies are at or above the minimum level of 2% of GDP for defense spending, more than twice as many as in 2021 and nearly eight times higher than when allies first set this benchmark nearly a decade ago. Cumulative spending uh, or defense spending for European allies is also collectively exceeding the 2% spending mark for the first time. And these numbers are going to continue to improve. Our allies are not just spending more on defense. They're also spending more to ensure Ukraine has what it needs to prevail on the battlefield. 
This spending is helping to revitalize production lines across the alliance, including here in the United States. We're manufacturing weapons that improve our military readiness and make the United States and allies more secure while at the same time strengthening our economies. This is something you're going to hear more about uh, from us tomorrow afternoon when Jake Sullivan addresses the Defense Industry Forum ahead of the summit. At the summit, allies will announce robust new measures of support for Ukraine. Allies will stand up a new NATO military command in Germany that will leverage NATO's institutional strengths to coordinate training and equipping and help Ukraine develop its future force. Allies will also announce a pledge of security assistance to Ukraine that will include 40 billion euro in support over the next year. In addition, NATO will appoint a civilian as the NATO senior representative in Kyiv to act as a focal point for NATO engagement with Ukrainian authorities. There is rightly considerable focus on what allies will say about Ukraine's membership path in the summit declaration. The language will be clear and forceful. It will recognize Ukraine's vital ongoing reform efforts and demonstrate allied support for Ukraine on its path to NATO membership. And on the sidelines of the summit, President Biden will host an event with President Zelensky and nearly two dozen of our allies and partners who've signed bilateral security agreements with Ukraine, which, of course, President Biden did uh, last month for the United States when he was the G7 summit in Apulia, Italy. The United States and allies will also announce new steps to strengthen Ukraine's air defenses uh, to help Ukraine continue to defend themselves and hopefully, hopefully prevent the types of brutal attacks like the one that we just witnessed on the Children's Hospital in Kyiv. Together, the Washington summit will send a strong signal to Putin that if he thinks he can outlast the coalition of countries supporting Ukraine, he's dead wrong. We're also going to send an important message to the rest of the world, including through our partnerships in the Indo-Pacific, that we stand stronger together, united, and in support of democratic values. Now, quickly turning to the schedule, uh, I'll go through some of the top line highlights for you. Um, Tomorrow evening, President Biden will welcome NATO leaders and he and Dr. Biden will host a 75th anniversary commemoration event at the Mellon Auditorium, which is the site, of course, of the original signing of the NATO-Washington Treaty, the North Atlantic Treaty. Uh, which established NATO in 1949. It's also the site of the 50th anniversary commemoration that was held by uh, President Clinton in 1999. On Wednesday, the president will host, uh, excuse me, will hold his first bilateral meeting with the new prime minister of the United Kingdom, Keir Starmer. And the president will welcome the 32 members of the alliance to a meeting of the North Atlantic Council. And that same evening, he and Dr. Biden will host a NATO uh, leaders, will host NATO leaders, rather, I should say, for a dinner at the White House. On Thursday morning, NATO will hold a meeting with the EU and with the NATO's Indo-Pacific partners. That's Australia, Japan, the Republic of Korea, and New Zealand to deepen our cooperation. Uh, In the afternoon, also on Thursday, there'll be a meeting of the NATO Ukraine Council after which the president will host an event with nearly two dozen allies and partners who have negotiated and signed bilateral security agreements, as I just mentioned. After that, the president will hold a press conference and take questions from the media. In addition to the program uh, with leaders I just laid out, there will be a number of side events that showcase a number of issues of importance to the alliance. Let me quickly run through these. That includes a defense industry forum at the Chamber of Commerce that uh, will be hosted on Tuesday with defense industry representatives. There's also a women, peace, and security event that Secretary Blinken will be hosting at the State Department on the same day. And NATO's public forum, which is a two-day event uh, adjacent to the summit site and aimed at promoting better understanding of NATO's policies and goals and the decisions to be adopted at the NATO summit will be held on the 10th and 11th. Separately and showcasing the strong cooperation between uh, our U.S. Congress, uh, bipartisan support for NATO, the U.S. Senate will host a bipartisan event Wednesday morning uh, with some of our ally leaders. Finally, as is customary for summits that the United States hosts, there will also be a leaders, spouses, and partners program 
hosted by Dr. Biden. So that's all I have for you here at the top. Now, happy to take your questions. Thank you so much for those remarks, Ambassador. Now we will take questions. Journalists on joining us online, remember to raise your hand. Those in the room, when I call on you, please state your name and your outlet. We'll take a question right here in the middle first. Thank you. Thank you, Dmitry Anopchenko, Ukrainian television correspondent, Interchannel. Mike, thank you for taking my question. Uh, you know, I have prepared different topics, but what happened in Ukraine today, honestly, as for Ukraine, it's heartbreaking, it's painful. And when you told that the U.S. will announce new st steps to stretch the Ukrainian air defense, may one believe that uh, those steps will make it possible to avoid those tragedies which, which happened today in Ukraine? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's clear that allies need to step up and provide Ukraine with additional air defense systems precisely in order to be able to prevent the types of tragedies that we've seen today, but sadly that we've seen time and again, month after a month since the beginning of this brutal and senseless war. Uh, attacks on maternity wards, on children's hospitals have unfortunately become all too common in the course of this conflict. We will announce in full detail later this week what we have in mind in terms of strengthening Ukraine's air defenses. But the United States, together with our allies and partners, has been committed to doing more to help Ukraine with air defense, including strategic air defense systems, precisely for this reason. Um, okay, let us go um, here to Ken in the middle. Hello, uh, Ken Moriyasu from Nikkei Asia. Uh, on the Indo-Pacific Partners, I believe uh, you used to call it AP4. Uh, is the wording going to be IP4 or IPP? And if there is no number in it, does that signal that there will be more members upcoming in the future? And this, is, I believe, is the third time that the leaders are uh, uh, participating, the IP4 leaders are participating. Is there some kind of a cementing of their participation at this summit? Thank you. Well, thank you. Obviously, our Indo-Pacific partners are incredibly important uh, to all of our NATO allies. It's an important region, and the security of Europe impinges upon the security of the Indo-Pacific, as Prime Minister Kishida has said on numerous occasions, and vice versa. Uh, so this is an important uh, time for us to be able to coordinate on such things as resilience, countering disinformation, defense industrial cooperation, and a range of other things. As for the nomenclature, I think we use IP4 and IPP interchangeably, and uh, certainly there are more partners that we have in the Indo-Pacific uh, that are of great value to the NATO alliance, and uh, we will seek to include other, other partners at other events in the future. These are the leaders that are coming to this particular summit. Okay, um, let's go um, here, right here, yes. Uh, Sohail Ishar, Al Ghad Television. Uh, I have a couple of questions, if I may. The first question Is there any concern among the NATO members if the US administration changed in this coming elections? And like many people were talking about Trump's unwillingness to cooperate with NATO as much as this current administration is. My second question is uh, about uh, what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, is there any concern from uh, the NATO leaders? And uh, will it be discussed during the forum or during the summit? There will be discussion of what's going to happen in the Middle East. And, you know, taking into consideration, there are some Arab representatives in, in the, you know, in the attendance. Thank you. So um, one of the benefits of my job is I don't do politics, but I will tell you that there is broad bipartisan support for NATO and for Ukraine. We expect that to continue. As I said in my opening remarks, NATO is the strongest and most powerful alliance in history. Uh, now at 32 allies, it's larger, stronger, more capable, better able to deter and defend than it has been at any time in its history. Uh, and we certainly will continue to invest uh, in those capabilities. Um, just just Wait, let me, we'll let me finish, finish and then we'll yeah. proceed to another question. When it comes to uh, the Middle East, look, I'm sure there's going to be a range of discussions, including bilateral meetings on the margins of the summit where this will come up. Uh, the Middle East is not Euro-Atlantic territory, but obviously it impinges on the security of the Euro-Atlantic region. So what's happening now in the Middle East is of course of concern uh, to all NATO leaders. Okay, I think we had another question from Danielle. 
Please introduce yourself. Yeah. Thank you, Daniele Compatangelo for La Setta, Italian News Network. Um, so um, we see NATO expanding somehow with um, in the Indo-Pacific, um, so not only as a trans transatlantic, but then in Europe we see the rise of the far right, and we saw Orban went to um, to Putin uh, to Russia a few days ago, uh, and there was it was backlash from many European leaders this move. So um, how do you see this visit? Um, done from the Hungarian president, who is the president right now of the European Council in Russia a few days ago, sir? Well, what I'll say on this is we don't find this helpful. I don't think it's going to support Ukraine and its efforts at finding peace or Ukraine's sovereignty or territorial integrity. And I think I'll leave it at that. Okay, um, we'll go here in the front to Bingru. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Bing Ru Wang with Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Um, my first question is to follow up the IP4. Um, as the NATO is expanding its um, cooperation with Asian allies, um, is NATO going to extend Article 5 to allies in Asia? And secondly, uh, we know this summit is going to feature Russian threat. Is this NATO summit also going to feature China threat? As you mentioned last week, NATO is um, uh, you mentioned about the solid language on China, that, which we can expect from the declaration. Um, will we see uh, also a more collective action this NATO is going to take against China? Thank you. Yeah, so NATO and our Indo-Pacific partners have a lot of common interests, and there is a wide opportunity for achieving better cooperation on a range of issues. I mentioned some of them, uh, such as cybersecurity, such as fighting disinformation, such as building up our defense industrial bases. Um, NATO is not expanding into the Indo-Pacific. There is no accession process. And all of NATO's defense and deterrence capabilities are located in the Euro-Atlantic area on the territory of NATO allies. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be talking. In fact, just the opposite. We should be cooperating, talking as much as we can, sharing threat perceptions. Uh, certainly Russia is a primary threat to NATO allies. But as I said on Friday, uh, the PRC has been directly providing support uh, to Russia's defense industrial base across a range of dual use items that have enabled not only the Russian military to target Ukraine, as we've seen tragically over the course of the last 24 hours with this strike on a children's hospital, but also that pose a longer term threat to European security. Um, and so that is something that is of immense concern to all NATO allies, uh, but also is something of concern to our Indo-Pacific partners. So I, I imagine that we'll have a robust conversation around that and that some of this threat will be reflected in the communique as well. Okay, we'll go here to Rusadaran. Thank you. Um, you have played an important role in helping to strengthen Georgia's... Please introduce your outlet. Oh, sorry. Uh, Residentialia, uh, Georgian News Agency, Global News Georgia. You have played an important role in helping to strengthen Georgia's security. Uh, but from today's perspective, when Russian influence is increasing there, and also we see China's intention in the region, um, from your perspective, at what stage is Georgia today in terms of uh, Euro-Atlantic in integration? And if I may ask you another question, the U.S. has postponed the noble partner exercise in Georgia due to false accusations by the Georgian government against uh, the U.S. and other Western partners. What is your take on that? Thank you very much. Thank you. So let me take the second part first. Um, a lot of our cooperation with Georgia right now is under review, um, including the noble partner exercise and other engagements that we have with the Georgian government. Uh, it's clear that over the course of the last few months, sadly, the Georgian government has moved in the wrong direction in terms of its Euro-Atlantic integration prospects. Um, we have long supported Georgia's sovereignty territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders. We have participated in upwards of 60 rounds of the Geneva International Discussions to support Georgia. Uh, so it is with, with some concern and sadness, frankly, that we see this uh, move in the other direction. But frankly, uh, when we see harassment of civil society, when we see laws being passed 
the limit the space for fundamental freedoms in Georgia. That's not compatible with the values that undergird the NATO alliance. Uh, nor, frankly, do we think it's compatible with Euro-Atlantic integration writ large, including the EU. Uh, so we hope to see a change in direction, strategic direction from the Georgian government. But right now, all of our programs with Georgia are under review. Okay, let's go here right in the front, Mr. Alex. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Alex Garfolo from Tony News Agency. Let me follow up on my colleague's question about today's uh, attack. You used multiple adjectives to describe it. You said horrific, you said brutal, senseless. How is it not an act of terrorism? And how do you want to divert, digest the fact that it's uh, conducted by the current chair of UN Security Council? And second question on, on NATO member Hungary, its president, uh, prime minister rather, uh, visited uh, Moscow. Um, what uh, European allies called it appeasement. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? Thanks so much. Look, I, you could use any number of adjectives to describe an attack on a children's hospital. I mean, just from a human point of view, it's horrific, it's tragic, it's senseless. Um, and by the way, it also needs to be seriously investigated because this is precisely one of the actions that we've seen repeatedly throughout the course of this war um, that will need to be looked at by those who are prosecuting war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, so I expect that this, this particular strike will also uh, deserves to have scrutiny uh, in that regard. Um, when it comes to, uh, I mean, I've already commented on Prime Minister Orban's visit to Moscow. We don't see this as constructive. We don't see this as advancing the peace process. It certainly doesn't help Ukraine. I think the Ukrainians have already commented on this themselves. Um, and I will just leave it at that. Okay. Um, let's go to right here in the second row. Um, yes, Yuka. Hello, I'm Jukka Lehtinen from uh, Finnish uh, newspaper Kaupalehti. Uh, now when uh, Finland and Sweden is also part of the NATO, is there going to be changes in the in the NATO force model? And is in this summit coming to be some changes for that? Yeah, thank you. I mean, obviously we're very pleased with the addition of two very capable members in Sweden and Finland. Uh, they bring unique sets of capabilities and assets to the table as NATO allies. Also, the geography helps NATO with the defense of the Baltic Basin. Uh, and so this will obviously create some slight nuances in terms of how we approach regional planning uh, in the north, uh, the types of capabilities, the types of force flow uh, models that we employ. Um, but uh, fundamentally, uh, they will be and already are integrated completely into all NATO activities, exercises, planning, uh, strategic reviews, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So these are two allies that, that make us stronger uh, and that make us uh, better able to deter and defend across the full alliance territory. Okay, I think the list had a question. Let's go way to the back. Thank you so much, Augustina Shamalis from Lithuanian Public Broadcaster. In your opening, you gave us a long list of uh, NATO accomplishments, and there's uh, for sure many things to be proud of. At the same time, when we look at Ukraine, it's not closer to victory than it was two years ago. It is, in fact, in probably more precarious position than it was two years ago. And at the same time, this in this summit, it doesn't look like there will be any game-changing decisions. So are we, is it not disappointing in this, in this context that we don't have any more ambitious goals in this summit and are we in danger of being basically complacent as an, as an alliance? Well, look, I'll take issue with your premise. Um, go back three months and look at all the dire predictions that a lot of you were making about where we would be at the time of the summit in terms of Ukraine's standing. Uh, since President Biden signed the supplemental bill into law in late April of this year, and we surged an additional $61 billion in support for Ukraine. We've rolled out, I believe it's six presidential drawdown packages. We have now reached an agreement in the G7 on unlocking uh, a $50 billion loan that will function as a grant for the benefit of Ukraine. Uh, there are going to be upwards of 20 countries that will have signed bilateral security agreements by the time of this summit. Those are 10-year agreements that will help sustain Ukraine's future force. And then there's what NATO itself is providing, the NATO Security Assistance and Training Ukraine, 
uh, program, which will stand up an entire command, an entire command in Wiesbaden to support Ukraine with training coordination, with logistics, with uh, security assistance, with force development, and that will be that bridge to membership that will take Ukraine into a position where when the political will is there for Ukraine to accede to the alliance, Ukraine will be fully ready on day one uh, to plug and play with the rest of the alliance. I think that is a dramatic trajectory in the course of the last three months. And so as opposed to the various dire predictions about where NATO would be and where allies would be in terms of supporting Ukraine, and I didn't even mention the air defense announcement, which will be forthcoming this week, an announcement on F-16s as well. All of this contributes to momentum at Ukraine's back. And the fact of the matter is the Ukrainians, they have stopped the Russians in Kyiv, they stopped them in Kharkiv, in, in Kherson, and now they are holding the line in the north as well. And the Russians continue to throw more and more bodies at the war, more and more forces. Their casualty rates are exceptionally high. Uh, but Ukraine is holding the line. Uh, do we wish that Ukraine were able to liberate its territory? Of, of course, and we will continue to support them uh, with that goal in mind. But uh, what they have accomplished over the course of these last uh, few months, bravely detend defending their territory, is nothing short of exceptional. Um, okay, let's go to you at the black, the pearl necklace. Thank you. Uh, Olga Koshalenko, One Plus One TV Ukraine, Ambassador, two questions, if I may. Uh, first of all, with regard to Ukraine-US security agreements that was signed just recently in Italy, just hypothetically, if administration changes, can you confirm that it is obligatory to fulfill by any administration in the United States? And uh, with regard to Ukraine counter defense group, so-called Rammstein group, will NATO take over leadership in this group? Okay, so let me take uh, your second question first. The Ukraine Defense Contact Group, also known as the Ramstein format, will continue to function as an effective means of rallying our allies and partners. It's over 50 countries, as you know, to provide critical support to Ukraine. The way it's structured, it's modeled around eight capability coalitions. There are countries that are uh, the leads on each one of these coalitions to provide vital support for Ukraine in areas such as maritime, air defense, air power, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that will continue. Some of the functions that have been part of the UDCG may over time flow to NATO as NATO gets more involved in training coordination, equipping coordination, logistics, and the like. Uh, but the UDCG will continue as sort of a flagship program uh, stood up by Secretary Austin to provide unprecedented levels of funding to Ukraine. And the on the bilateral security agreement, it's a, as you know, it's a 10-year executive agreement. The 10 years is designed, it's modeled uh, along the same lines as many of our partners and allies, designed to show Putin that he can't outlast us, that this is a long-term commitment to Ukraine's future force, and that we want to give them the capabilities to be able to deter and defend, not just now, but well into the future. It is an executive agreement between the United States and Ukraine. Okay, um, let's go to this gentleman here um, with the you. Yes, please. Uh, Adrian Morrow with uh, the Globe and Mail. What sort of conversation, Ambassador, do you anticipate there being at the summit over Canada? Um, you know, not really having a, a concrete plan to get to to two percent, sort of falling behind other NATO countries and in, in meeting that commitment that's made, and currently only going. You know basically having a plan to get to 1.75 and, and not sort of detailing how they're going to get beyond that. Is it sort of time to put more pressure on Canada to, to fulfill the commitment? Well, I think one of the things you'll see um, at the summit, certainly behind closed doors, is that there will be a lot of allies holding each other's feet to the fire in terms of defense spending commitments. Uh, burden sharing is at the heart of the alliance. It's been reiterated uh, for years, ever since the Wales Pledge, but actually, frankly, even going back before Wales, it's always been one of the first points raised in allied settings. And so I expect that that pressure on allies that are not at the 2% threshold to continue uh, to be vocalized so that we have equitable burden sharing cross the lines. Now that said, 
Canada has been very forward leaning in terms of its support for Ukraine, both rhetorically, but also in terms of some of the capabilities that they have provided. Um, and we hope to see a credible plan at some point for uh, reaching the 2% benchmark. I, I, I don't know what leaders will say publicly about this. Okay, I think we have time for just one more. We're just going to take one question online. Um, so um, would our journalist uh, Tuna Sandley please unmute yourself, turn your screen on and ask your question in your outlet. Uh, I'm Tuna Şanlı from Turkish Radio Television, the public broadcaster of Turkey. And Ambassador Carpenter, thank you for your time. Uh, Ambassador Car Carpenter, you visited Ankara on July 1st and 2nd and met with Turkish officials to discuss cooperation on a wide range of issues and develop additional areas for increased partnership between Turkey and the United States prior to the NATO summit. Uh, this summit is a historic one, which NATO alliance leaders uh, are coming back to Washington, D.C., where the alliance born 75 years ago. Turkey greenlighted the Sweden and Finland membership to NATO. Turkey plays a critical role in Mediterranean and Black Sea, uh, let's say, NATO southern flank. And especially in last decade, Turkey's role and influence expand beyond its region and its defense industry grow rapidly. So first of all, Ambassador Carpenter, can you please tell us uh, about your meetings in Ankara and how does the U.S. administration describe Turkey's importance for NATO? Thank you. Well, thanks for the question. I mean, we had a very wide ranging, uh, productive set of conversations in Ankara uh, at the beginning of last week on a range of issues, including Ukraine, including the Middle East, including NATO and the summit this week, including uh, bilateral cooperation uh, on, on also a, a range of issues, including counterterrorism uh, and much more. Uh, obviously, Turkey is a critical ally. They sit at a very important juncture, uh, both in terms of the Eastern Med, in terms of the South Caucasus, in terms of the Black Sea. Uh, what Turkey has done with the Montreux Convention has been very important in terms of limiting Russian warships in the Black Sea. Um, it, it's an important ally, and obviously we need to continue to have that conversation with our, with our Turkish friends about uh, this range of issues. Okay, thank you, sir. I know you have a busy week this week, um, so we're going to end the Q and A session right now. Um, sir, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? No, I think uh, I think we're good. Thank you. Okay, so I would like to give a special thanks to our briefer for sharing his time with us today, and for all of you who joined us, please have a good, safe week. Thank you.